Thank you. Now I've got the, hopefully I got the technology down. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, I'm going to be talking about basically sensor data in, in the ocean, and we like to talk about it as, as what we call the internet connected ocean or the internet of things in the ocean. First, I'll just give you a very brief motivation. I think this audience knows well the motivation for Ocean Networks Canada, but it's really based on the fact that most of the satellite data we collect uh, represents a surface ocean. And you've heard talks this morning about how we have to understand places like the, in, the uh, internal Arctic Ocean, and that's what Ocean Networks Canada is all about. And in addition to trying to understand what I call the sea beneath the surface, it's really what we call a complex ocean system. What, the intention of Ocean Networks Canada was not only to observe the water masses and the life in those water masses, but also to understand the interaction with the continents, for example, underwater landslides and gas venting. But because of the location, that the first locations of these internet connected oceans, it's also trying to understand the processes beneath the seafloor, including how, how the spreading centers are, 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 are behaving how in fact that the seafloor venting actually interacts with the ocean, and, and in fact how in this part of the world, how, this, how the seismicity is changing with time. In fact, the concept for uh, a cabled ocean observing system came from observations of the fact that the axial seamount in the 90s erupted and no one was there to see it. So it was that fa the fact that all of these, these processes, not only in the water but in the seafloor, are dynamic, and if we don't have persistence there, in the ocean, we won't be able to understand these processes. So what came out of that, the first cable observing system came, uh, was, was installed here, just up our coast, where we are right now today. And it started with Venus uh, in Sandwich Inlet, for those of you who landed here at the airport, uh, very close to, to, to uh, the airport is, is the first cable system that's now been operational for 10 years. Then another cable was put in the Strait of Georgia uh, the following year. And then Neptune was installed in late 2009. These systems have now been operating 24-7. And as I mentioned, they really are designed to observe this beneath the seafloor, on the seafloor, in the water column. And now we're just beginning with, with work, for example, that Maysira is doing, understanding the, the ocean atmosphere system. And so these, these uh, nodes actually have extension cables that, that then connect to instruments that, like I said, are beneath the seafloor, on the seafloor, and in the water column. And we've expanded, as I'll, I'll, I'll explain in my talk today, about where we're going, where we've gone now, and where we're going in the future. But we've, we've expanded by installing set sensors on ferries. We have autonomous systems that are operational. We operate gliders. And we're now moving along into other areas of Canada. But this is all based on science. And so we have our, our infrastructure is for basic science. Understanding climate change is a big theme. Life in the Northeast Pacific and Salish Sea from microbes to whales. Seafloor ocean atmosphere links, I'll give you a few examples. And then seafloor motion. As you can imagine, seafloor motion is a theme of understanding the great subduction earthquakes and the tsunamis that they generate. So just for this talk, I'll just give you a few brief examples of each of these themes. And the first is, uh, is the warm blob. I think most of you know about the warm blob. I heard in the last talk that blob seems to be a common, common uh, term in your field. <laughs> so lots of warm blobs. But the warm blob, um, if you look on the left, is, uh, is El Nino in 97, the temperature anomaly for El Nino. And on the right is the beginning of not only, um, oops, let me back up. not only El Nino, but you can also see the presence of the warm blob in the Northeast Pacific. So this was a surprise to many oceanographers that this very anomalous uh, temp temperature anomaly occurred in the Northeast Pacific. But what we were trying to understand at Ocean Networks Canada is how does that impact the coastal ocean? Because it's a coastal ocean where people live, where activities occur, and how is that changing the actual ecosystems along the coast? So in Santa Inlet, this is a 10-year record of temperature, oxygen, uh, and other parameters, and I'm going to just talk about the temperature and the oxygen, the temperatures on the bottom, oxygen at the top. And you can see the El Nino, the earlier El Nino, where you can see that in the wintertime the temperature stayed very high. Similarly with the beginning of uh, the El Nino and the warm blob, but it's even higher because of that influence, and now it's remained high. And the impact on the oxygen is very dramatic in terms of, of, of low dissolved oxygen. 
subsequent to these, these measurements and the understanding of these changes over the long term, we can now go in, and last summer, scientists went into Santa Inlet to actually document through RLV surveys that in fact the ecosystem in Santa Inlet, which is a fjord that water masses have to travel extensive distances to impact, have actually disrupted that biological system. So these satellite data help us to look at these institute um, measurements, and that helps us then focus studies to understand how these kinds of extreme climate events impact the local ecosystem. In terms of other kinds of life, this is an image that I like to show because it's, it's very dynamic. This is a, a place we call Bubbly Gulch. There's methane coming out of the seafloor all the time. These crabs go there, they feed on the, on the bacteria, on the, on the bubbles, and then the, this, this example is where the hydrates that are outside the bubbles of, of the methane actually, actually accumulate on the belly of these crabs, and methane's lighter than water, so they do backflips. So scientists, we're, we're not sure if they go there for fun, or for food, or for both. But we, we discover these kinds of things all the time, even from citizen scientists all over the world. We had a Ukrainian boy discover a marine mammal uh, feeding, a very unusual feeding uh, pr process. And we had a, a male worker from Minnesota discover a, a huge crab migration. And we're, we're so happy we can keep those male workers uh, busy while they're, while they're on the night shift. This is just another example of the same area, Bubbly Gulch, where we're trying to understand the fluxes of, of the gas hydrates. And so we've, had, we've update, upgraded our, our, sen our acoustic sensors so that we can very, very precisely um, quantify the flux of methane going into, into the ocean. As you know, methane, methane is undersaturated in the ocean, but it's studies like this that will help us understand how much is actually reaching the atmosphere, how much is interacting with the ocean to change its chemistry, and in places like the Arctic, where we'd like to have these same systems, we can then understand what is the impact of the methane released into the atmosphere in those shallower waters of the ocean. And of course, uh, this is our most, uh, most dynamic location for, for, for Neptune at the Endeavour node of, of, of the Neptune uh, array. And it's on the Endeavour segment of the Juan de Fuca Ridge. This is a place where black smokers are formed, as you can see. And these, we're measuring in situ the temperatures that are coming out of these systems. And as you know well, these black smokers form because this 300 plus degree C mineral rich water hits the cold ocean water forming these giant chimneys and they're initially barren of life and then life actually uh, accumulates on these black smokers. So we're studying life on the, how life evolves in these systems as part of understanding how life evolved on the earth. Some scientists are trying to understand how these minerals could be used from a, from a resource perspective, although this location that we're in is a marine protected area, but our technology is there to be used should there be uh, resource extraction in other parts of the world. And we've just uh, in, uh, installed uh, current meter in this location so we can understand how, how deep sea currents are influenced by this incredible influx of heat and, and very different water masses into the, into the seafloor. Of course, we, we want to understand the, this location, so uh, you probably weren't here last week, but last week here in British Columbia, we all took part in what's, what's called the, sh the Great Shakeout. So we practiced to be sure that we would be safe during an earthquake. So for those of you who don't know, you should make sure you have a flashlight next to your bed and shoes next to your bed should there be an earthquake at night so that you can put your shoes on and not and get out of a, get, get to a safe place and not cut yourself on glass and with a flashlight know where you're going. And so be, be safe if a great earthquake starts here. But we have, the last great earthquake here was in, was January 26, 1700. They happen on a frequency of about 300 to 500 years. We are very interested in understanding this and we have seismometers all over the network to try to further understand this subduction earthquake and other earthquakes in the region. We're also interested in understanding and working with tsunami researchers, so we have some of the most precise tsunami wave sensors on the Neptune network. And we're taking those, those sensor data and we're taking models from the Net Natural Resources Canada, Geological Survey of Canada, and updating the tsunami models for this region. We're also then integrating them with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration digital elevation model. And I, I don't have the, the high resolution version here, but we were able to update a location that's at great risk here on the west coast of Vancouver Island, a place called Port Alberni, with inundation maps that now demonstrate 
that that town has to actually have increased level of planning to, to secure them from a great subduction earthquake and tsunami. So it's a combination of our data, real-time data to calibrate models and to actually generate model results for tsunami, the, the Natural Resources Canada rupture models, tsunami models, and then the digital elevation models to actually precisely locate where that inundation will occur. We're also, to also do all of this, we need a, an incredible data management system, and I'm proud to say, I think we're the world leaders in ocean sensor data like these. We are, in, in essence, bi a big data provider. Now, big data sometimes is associated with volume. We have volume, but it's not the greatest in the world. I'll give you some numbers. But it's, it's really about diversity of data. We have, we're recognized by the World Data System, by the International Council for Science. Um, but I'm making this uh, pitch to you because if you have data needs, this kind of system can help you. Um, the diversity goes from temperature sensors, you know, a point at one time, like an Argo data set, to vector-related data from, for example, acoustic Doppler current pro profilers, to streaming data, for example, hydrophone, optics, video, etc. So the diversity of data makes our system incredibly uh, uh, powerful, and it's interactive. So for example, we have uh, camera systems that can be controlled, controlled by scientists. We have a crawler on the seafloor that's controlled by a scientist in Germany. He drives it around when he wakes up, having his, his espresso in the morning. Um, we also have sampling systems that can be triggered either by a scientist or automatically if they're sensing something else. So it's this interactive nature, the diversity of data and the volume. We're now at over 450 terabytes of data accessible over the internet to anyone in the world for free. And we're now always developing new tools for scientists to actually use these data in ways that, that makes it helpful for them. We're always interested in new communities. And if you have a data need, we'd like to talk with you about how we can help you deliver, see, analyze your own data. And so I'm going to move to the, the title of the talk, Smart Oceans and Coasts. What we now have been doing, we are funded from the Canadian government for really the Science Foundation I just talked about. Anyone in the world can come and use these data for their own research purposes. But now we're actually focusing on what can we do as a Canadian funded infrastructure to protect our own ocean and coast here in Canada. And it started in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. So this is in the Arctic. And in 2012, uh, we decided to put something in, in uh, Cambridge Bay because the previous prime minister, his name was Harper, if you can remember that name, and he uh, had promised that there would be a, a Canadian higher research station, but by 2012, he announced this in 2007, by 2012 there was nothing there. So we said, okay, we know how to put something in the water, so we put a small system in Cambridge Bay, just off the dock, essentially, and this is just an animation of it, but it started in 2012, and we decided not only to put this small system uh, off the dock, but also to engage the community to see, well, could they use these data for some particular purpose? And because of that, we, we put a new kind of sensor on this observatory. It's a sea ice profiler uh, that is, is, uh, is, um, okay. is manufactured here on Vancouver Island. And that sea ice profiler has been used by the community because they're interested in, in the ice thickness so that if they choose, they can take a shortcut from town to the airport if the ice is thick enough. But then we saw that the science community was very interested in these data. And now these data are being used by a wide range of scientists even, and we've moved it further offshore since 2012. It's been operational 24 seven since then. And to this community, I'd say that this is a, an in-situ laboratory for a, a testing uh, algorithms because there's a wide range, range of sensors here in an ice-covered uh, ice system. Just to show you some of the data, this is the top data is uh, sea ice growth and then decay uh, or thawing. And on the bottom are, are, are parameters about phytoplankton and oxygen that, uh, that, that then show you in this particular uh, data set that the actual uh, phytoplankton expansion and oxygen occur much before the actual uh, sea ice goes away in the winter. We have other data now because we're, we're starting to measure CO2. We're testing pH sensors of this site. So it's really a test site that you can think about for calibrating some of the work that you do. At, for example, we, we, we are going to be, you can't really interpret these data with the, without having in-situ data like these. This is before freeze-up and after freeze-up at that, at that time of year. 
So you might want to think about not only Neptune and Venus as experimental locations for testing uh, properties and algorithms that you use, but also this very small but powerful observatory in the Arctic. So because we were able to demonstrate to our funders that uh, we could install a system in the Arctic and keep it going 24-7, uh, without people there, we only go up once a year to operate and maintain it. We also put a proposal in to expand these, what we call community observatories, into the north coast of British Columbia, Prince Rupert, Kitimat Village. For those of you who don't know, Kitimat is at the head of the beautiful Douglas Channel. In Hartley Bay, which is a community along the Doug Douglas Channel. In, in another location, Campbell River on Vancouver Island. And expand the systems on Neptune and Venus. And because we decided that this is really, we want to do something that benefits the country, not just the scientific and researchers, we decided to also um, begin to produce what we call data products using the data from these observatories. The data products are about improving marine safety, environmental monitoring, and public safety. I'll give you a few examples of those, but most importantly in terms of, um, of environmental monitoring, one of the issues that has been um, hovering over Canada recently, if you read the news now that you're here, um, is that there is human pressures in these places that are incredibly, incredibly remote. And so there's not been any observations in these areas, and there's a, there's a, there's a commitment in this country to First Nations, and these areas are populated by, by First Nations who have rights, and they are very interested in understanding the environmental benchmark, and being part of decision making should there be expansion of these in these areas of human impact. Human impact such as turning a smelter back on or having an export location for, for hydrocarbons. And so we were funded to install these systems. They were all installed in March of this year or, or they're, they're, they're all coming on stream. They include uh, community observatories like I showed you in the Arctic, uh, radar systems, uh, and automatic identification system sensors for, sh for ship, sh ship tracking include, and also in the environmental sensors, we have uh, a dense network of hydrophones because that's one of the iconic areas that I'll mention again as I give you some examples here today. We're all, just before I move on to the examples of the smart ocean systems, uh, because of the, the strength of Oceans 2, uh, we are delivering data from other locations. We're delivering data from the East Coast, the Fundy Ocean Research Center for Energy. It's a tidal turbine test bed. We'll soon be delivering uh, radar data from, from the Halifax region. We'll soon be delivering buoy data from offshore Newfoundland. These are some of the, some of the only uh, persistent ocean observations in those, in those region, regions. We'll be expanding <coughs> a community observatory into Church in Manitoba in, in partnership with the University of Manitoba. And there are proposals in, in this area of the Arctic for installing a very uh, sophisticated observatory system in Baffin Bay, including a cabled system and moorings uh, and gliders, uh, as well as community observatories along the coast. So those proposals are actively being discussed with funding agencies in Canada. We deliver the Arctic Drifter buoy. We, have a, we, have, we just got funded to do a design study for a cabled system in Gascoigne Inlet and we are putting a proposal in to put in a cabled system in, Re in Resolute. We're partnering with others in Alaska to, to deliver data from, uh, from communities that collected themselves, and I'll show you an example of that. So what we're trying to do is not only leverage other activities from other departments, for example, this is the, a Defense Department interest, but they're interested in working with scientists to have that installed for open data purposes. So to come back to the Smart Ocean Data products, I, I gave you an example of the tsunami alerts. We have the ability to provide alerts where our data goes to the Pacific Tsunami Sensor, but we've also installed a radar system off the west coast of, of Vancouver Island to identify uh, tsunami waves that are generated at our subduction zone. And that system just got operational and we actually de detected a, a big wave that was generated from a major storm two week weekends ago. So this system, we're going to have to develop it further, could be the tsunami alert system for Vancouver Island. We're developing sea state alerts. I'll give you an example of that. Marine mam I'll give you an example of marine mammal avoidance. We want to provide real-time traffic alerts for fish, ship traffic alerts for First Nations. We, our data are used for oil spill response. Sea ice thickness and forecasts are now part of our, our data suite. The data I showed you from the Arctic are now being ingested into the Canadian Ice Service models 
to actually forecast freeze up and thaw. And critically important for northern communities where, where they need to know how, when they can, they can rely on uh, receiving resupply. And earth, I'll give you uh, the, our most advanced data product is earthquake early warning. So just to show you uh, what we are, are uh, delivering, this is the, uh, the, the transit route from the Port of Vancouver to the open ocean. The Port of Vancouver is the biggest port in Canada. And right now, uh, Ocean Networks Canada, we're the only deliverer of coastal radar. Those of you who are very familiar from the US know that this is ringing the US, except for the state of Washington. But not only are we delivering these data, providing real-time surface currents and direction, but we're also combining these data with weather-generated wave information to provide a sea state alert that we will be delivering direct, directly to pilots on vessels so they can make decisions about safely transiting these narrow passages that have extremely complex current systems. In terms of uh, the way we're delivering data products, we, we're delivering them from a perspective of a subscription basis. So unfortunately, this is not ready. I can't hand it to you today so you can protect yourself here in, on Vancouver Island. But this is similar to other systems that are being developed in, in the US, similar to what's already in place in Japan. But when, it, as, when an earthquake happens, there are two, uh, earth, there are two energy waves that, are, that transmit through the earth, a primary wave, secondary wave. Primary wave, as you probably all know, is very fast. This is slower. And we are installing sensors on the seafloor and on land to actually be able to identify the location and magnitude of the earthquake and then provide the seconds needed to protect yourself from, uh, from the ground shaking that arrives uh, from the S wave rather than from the P wave. So what, we're, what we've already developed is an algorithm that uh, we demonstrated on an iPhone. On an iPhone. This, but this algorithm can be located on any system uh, in, in, in a city, for example, in a, in a, in a, on a computer system at a, train, at, a, at a train control center. But what this does is will provide you with the time before major shaking arrives where you are located the strength of it, and, and some more information about that. We, we think we better change the snooze button. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't done yet, so we'll, we'll work on that. It should say, like, run or something. <laughs> so uh, that's, th but this is the idea for all of these products, that they'll be subscription-based, and then, then, we, then entities can su subscribe to them. So right now, we're, we're funded. We are now going to be the provider of earthquake early warning for the southern British Columbia. We're in the, in the process. We've installed two sensors offshore. And now this winter, we'll be, we'll be uh, densifying the sensor network on Vancouver Island. So by 20, end of 2018, early 2019, we'll have a system that can then be tested and, and commissioned for earthquake early warning. As I mentioned, ocean health is a really big issue here in most of the world, but here, particularly in British Columbia. And so what, one of the biggest issues is cumulative impacts. This is a picture of Hartley Bay. In Douglas Channel, there was a smelter that was operational, uh, and the First Nations attribute the loss of uh, the, the candlefish uh, to that smelter. That is now down. That could become operational, but without data to assess the impact on the waterway, should that smelter come online again, you, you'll, just, you'll just be guessing. So both industry and First Nations are interested in ensuring that we have high quality real-time human data on the, on the water quality. It also helps us with environmental benchmarking in terms of what's there now, how has it changed. We're working with others to do ocean health reporting in many of these areas. And most important to, to many of the communities is ocean noise. So we're working with the Port of uh, Vancouver uh, we, you know, on what's called the ECHO project. It's an acronym, and I can't remember what it stands for, but it's about uh, whales. So this is a sophisticated hydrophone system that sits right in the shipping channel, and it's the first of its kind that's publicly available. M many of you probably work with the Navy and know that the Navy does this all the time by capturing the, source the sound source signature of ships, but never before has it been public a public system available to all researchers. So we're getting lots of inquiries from around the world on this. We're we've now captured over 2,000 ship source signatures. The concept here is to try to reduce the noise that these ships make. We think that in, and by socializing this further, the shipping industry will be interested in reducing ocean noise because as you know well, noise means loss of energy. Loss of energy means your ship is inefficient, you're burning more fuel, more CO2 into the atmosphere. So that's one aspect of this, this effort that we're working on with the port. 
Port of Vancouver is incredibly progressive, trying to uh, move forward with incentives for ships to move in a green manner. This is one of the areas they could move into where they could actually have a, a, favor, a favorable rec receipt of ships into their harbor, sh into the port, should they reduce their noise. The other aspect, though, is we're using the same system because of the hydrophone uh, system that, that's out there to actually develop our algorithm for marine mammal avoidance in this region. As you may know, this is the area of the southern resident killer whales, but also, most importantly, other whales that actually get hit by ships. Just a month ago, another fin whale was brought up into the port of Vancouver, dead on the bow of a, a cruise ship. We want to try to figure out how we can begin to, to, to eliminate those, those impacts. So we're, we're working on an algorithm to identify the location of pods of whales. And we, because we capture all of the automatic identification system for Canada, we can take those data, combine them, and provide alert to pilots to actually do something to avoid impacting, impacting marine mammals. This is just an example of the hydrophones that we use. This is a um, Ocean Sonics um, IC Listen hydrophone. High quality hydrophones. We're working with two Canadian companies, uh, Ocean Sonics and Jasco. So we think we have some of the best hydrophone systems developed here in the world. We demonstrate them all the time on our, on our network. You can go online and listen to these hydrophones. And they're very high quality data, well calibrated, consistent, so you can compare them to other. I mentioned that we're also working with, uh, with, uh, with the Alaska to actually uh, do two things. One is to get people who are in coastal communities engaged in their own data capture, and secondly, to expand the footprint of our environmental monitoring. So we're working with the Pacific Salmon Foundation, and they actually uh, pay fishers to go out in their fishing grounds weekly and, uh, and deploy a, a, a CTD. Uh, do profiles uh, regularly in these locations, and then what we've developed is a, a, a tablet that allows the, a wireless transmission of the data, and then when it comes into internet connectivity, the data gets uploaded. Eventually, um, the people in these communities will be able to, to do the operations and maintenance of these 24-7 observatory systems themselves. And then, then with that, they will be able to uh, be able to grow in their knowledge of science and technology, and become more powerful in terms of their use of, of, of science for their own decision making in their own communities. So we're, we're not there yet, but that's the way we're going with these programs. We've engaged with 51 First Nations. We have eight agreements in place. These are important, um, important collaborations that, uh, that we value extremely uh, highly because of the fact that First Nations are uh, the, a critical part of Canada and they have uh, significant ownership of these, of these areas where they're at risk or important for us to do research in terms of climate change impacts. So I would just like to close with uh, just a short a video that shows uh, the images from, from uh, the, space, from the uh, space shuttle and uh, then how we actually see the sea beneath the surface. So thank you very much. Thank you.